And this is also the statement of Imams Abu Hanifa, Malik, and al Shafi'i, Rahimahumullah. And this is to remain the place, this is to stay until the gift has reached its place. Qatada says the place here is referring to the time of sacrifice and not necessarily the Kaaba itself because the meat doesn't have to be slaughtered directly in front of the Kaaba. Some have said that it is the Haram, like Ibn Mas'ud, Al Hassan, Ata, Tawus, Mujahid, Ibn Sirin, Al Thawri, and Abu Hanifa. But secondly, it's been said that the place that it is slaughtered at is sufficient if one cannot reach the Kaaba. And this is stated by Imams Malik. Shafi'i and Ahmed. Close quote. So if a sacrifice is being given, like today, today's time at Hajj, you cannot necessarily get to Masjid al Haram to do the slaughter inside of Masjid al Haram, much less to get to the Kaaba. It's done if you're walking that tract along Mina, if you walk from Muzdalifa to Mina, excuse me, from Mina, if you're walking from Mina, to Muzdalifa, you'll walk along the tract and you'll be able to see the tract of land where the sheep are being kept because there are so many of them and so many people that they can't obviously all be slaughtered and done in front of the Kaaba or at Masjid al-Haram because the crowds at Masjid al-Haram, the people at Masjid al-Haram, everything else to negotiate all of that space the people from outside of the school of Imam Ahmed have borrowed his fatwa because they've had to, otherwise they would have to say that it has to be do done there as a condition. And if it wasn't done there, the sacrifice wouldn't count. But they borrowed Imam Ahmed's fatwa because they realized that there's certain contingencies in place that have to be adhered to. It's just it's 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 too unbelievable. It can't be dealt with. Size is too great. Imam Ibn Jawzi rahimahullah, he says, and this is our final section for today, he says, quote. And whoever was ill or had an ailment in his scalp should give a, a expiation. This was sent down for a reason. Ka'ab ibn Ajra had a lot of lice in his head. And it caused him difficulties in his face. So this ayah was sent down. And he used to say, I feel happy because this ayah was sent down about me specifically. Our Shaykh Ali ibn Ubaidullah, he said, when Allah said, and do not shave your heads until the gift reaches its place, he said, it is haram to shave the head. Whether he found any ailment or he didn't find any ailment. This was the case until Allah then revealed as a dispensation. Whoever among you is ill or has an ailment of a scalp or his head, then it was permitted to shave the head if someone had a scalp ailment, as long as they gave an expiation. So this was an abrogation to the earlier prohibition. So whoever, meaning whoever's in ihram, and he has an illness, or he has an ailment that requires him to break some of the sanctity of the ihram, then he does so. And he treats the ailment of his head or whatever illnesses. So he must give a expiation by way of fasting. Now with the fasting that he must do, there are three things that need to be said. One is that it could be three days. As per the hadith of Ka'b ibn Ajra from the Prophet And this is the statement of the vast majority. Secondly, he could fast 10 days, as narrated by Al-Hasan, Ikrima, Nafi'a, and others. And then he could also give sadaqah, in which it involves him feeding six needy people, as narrated from the hadith of Ka'ab. One possibility is if he feeds 10 needy people. 
And then also he does another sacrifice, which would be to sacrifice a sheep for the sake of Allah in the fact of the mistake that he did or the dispensation that he has to take, he makes a sacrifice. Now when Allah says, and when you are safe, meaning from the enemy or the illness or whatever was hindering your hajj to be completed, then you commit the rest of the actions of hajj and you do the expiation. Whoever did tamattu, meaning that whoever began by making umrah in the months of hajj, then he came back to make hajj in the same year as was required, he must give a hadi. He must give a gift. This is the statement of Ibn Umar, Ibn Musayyib, Ata al Bahak. We've already discussed this previously. If he didn't find a hadi, then he must fast three days while on hajj. This is before the days of tarwiyah. Meaning, this is before the 8th of Dhul Hijjah and the day of Arafah. As said by Ata, Sha'bi, Abu Aliya, Ibn Jubayr, Tawus, and Ibrahim. And this ruling is narrated from Ali ibn Abi Talib himself. It's also narrated from Al Hassan, from Ata, two statements. As for the 10 days, if he wills, he may fast them concurrently. Or one day and then another day, one day and another day. As narrated from Tawus, Mujahid, Ata, and they said, in any of the months of Hajj, he may fast those days. Now, if he didn't find a gift to give to Allah, and he didn't fast the three days before the day of sacrifice, then what is he supposed to do? Umar ibn al-Khattab and Ibn Abbas, Ibn Jubayr, Tawus, and Ibrahim all say, it is not permitted for him to do so unless he has a hadi, And if not, he must fast. Ibn Umar and Aisha say, he fasts in the days of Mina to make up for this fact. Salih narrated from Ahmed this same statement. It is also the statement of Malik. Others say that one is not to fast the days of Tashriq, but they fast after them in returning from Hajj. Close quote. So this statement as the last and final statement is basically telling us what happens if you're on Hajj and we're so far we've reached the area where we're talking about contingencies that happen if someone is doing al hajj al If someone is in that situation where they're doing tamattu, they're faced with a number of challenges because it says that they give what's easy from the hadi. Now, what if they were struggling or they didn't find the hadi and they didn't fast the three days in time? Right? Some say, no, it's permitted for them to fast on the days of Minna to make up for what they missed from before. Now, here's, here's the important part. You get out to there to do al-hajj al You do the umrah. Everything's fine. Everything's great. You take off the ihram. The months of hajj come. You were there for the whole time. Now you're at Minna. You are waiting to get news of whether or not your party's sheep have been slaughtered. You cannot shave your hair for the men, and the women don't cut off a small finger size of their hair until they've got news that all of the team's sheep have been slaughtered. When they do that, you may slaughter, you may shave the hair for the men, or the women cutting a small finger size of hair, a swatch of hair, and you go out of your ihram in terms of clothing, but you still may not have sexual intercourse with your spouse. You head back to Mecca, and you do all the rites of the tawaf of ziyara and everything else. You must return you're stoning for two days and when you've completed the stoning for two days 
turn, you commit the other, you commit the other rice of Hajj. It is around that time that now you have completed all the rites of Hajj. So you are now what's called in Hal. You are in a complete state of Hal, meaning as you were before you put on Hal. So it's important that we understand these because it's going to come up a little bit later because we are now officially in Kitab al-Hajj, we're in the book of Hajj in the Quran. So Allah is telling you, when you come to my house, I'm telling you what I expect from you. This is what you have to do, or it's, I'm not going to accept it. You have to do this. So right now, we're just talking about, this is what happens on tamattu, And Allah mentioned it specifically in the Quran, where He specifically said, فَمَنْ تَمَتَّعَ Whoever did tamattu. So He specifically mentioned it. The other ones He referred to by euphemism. But this one was specifically mentioned. Because the Prophet Sallallahu recommended this to his ummah, whereas Ali radiallahu anh, he did the one that the Prophet Sallallahu did, which was Qiran. Because he wanted to do the same thing that he did. But the Prophet Sallallahu knowing it would be hard for his ummah, for some of them to do Qiran, he recommended them to Mattu'ah, so they would have the necessary rest in the Rukhsa. And we find this many times where the Prophet Sallallahu as a prophet, does things different to the rest of his ummah. And he gives his ummah a difference because he wants to make sure that they don't have any hardship on them. أقول قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم أستغفر الله إن الله غفر الرحيم 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 ولا إله إلا الله. I realize I have covered a lot of area in a short period of time, and I have most likely missed over uh, a lot of sections. All right, we're still, like I said in the beginning of the books of Hajj, and I think, inshallah, by next week when we come out of it, it will have a much fuller picture. The Imam will explain further, and I'll try to sort of sew up any areas that may come up where I think, okay, there may be confusion, and then hopefully, inshallah, we'll be on a little bit stronger uh, footing. Is there, is there a uh, question over anything of what I've covered? I know I've ran over a lot of material. I apologize if I didn't elucidate it enough. Yes? Okay, the question is, if somebody does not wake up for suhoor, is it valid for them to still fast in Ramadan? Alhamdulillah, salatu wa rasulillah. Yes, it is still valid if somebody does that. The same thing counts for someone asked the Prophet sallallahu about if, uh, if they had uh, sexual intercourse with their spouse during the night in Ramadan and slept and woke up in the morning and had to make ghusl and everything else, they're still counted as, as having all of those rights upon them. It's still permitted. They still must fast. So it's not nullified by that. It's going to be harder, and it's better if someone tries to wake you up so that we have a buddy system because many of us, it, the suhoor, the Prophet wasallam told us, try not to leave the suhoor because it is the sunnah, and the Jews, the people of the book don't have suhoor. So we should try not to not to do so if we don't have to. Is there another question? Another question? No? Yes. You know, you know the, like, uh, the three fudges that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, which one of those refer to the different uh, twilight zones between the mothers? Question is, uh, which of the um, three fudges refers to uh, the different periods of twilight that seems to be a difference in uh, the United Kingdom? Alhamdulillah, salatu salam rasulillah. Most likely what people are tending to try to argue or differ about is Al-Fajr al-Sadiq. But the problem with their disputing in this matter is either the twilight is there or it's not. When someone asked me, well, are you doing civil or such and such twilight? I don't know. I'm doing Al-Fajr al-Sadiq. I don't know what it is in English. I just, I'm looking. The light is there. It's physically there. I can see it. It's time for Fajr. That's all I care about. Other people get into, well, is this nautical twilight, civil twilight? And some people get into other areas. Listen, the main thing we want to know is, is the light discernible? If it's not, it's not. If it is, it is. I don't care what the wording is. All we want to know is, is that light there? The same thing for the shafaq. The brothers, some brothers, uh, because uh, one of the qawls in the Hanafi school is that the yellow light has the, 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 the asfar has to disappear for Isha to become wajib, right? 
some say no it's got to be the red redness because of the hadith right the position of the hanris and the shafis and hanafi and the, and the malikis is that redness right must disappear right but the hanafis do have another position for the yellowness so when you find brothers that are arguing about Aisha and not appearing or not appearing, you have a qawl within your school that's based upon the hadith where you don't have to put yourself through that. You see, but people have argued and they've said, no, there is no Aisha. Or they've said, in this, subhanAllah, there is no Aisha, so there is no tarawih, or there is no fajr. So they say, subhanAllah, there is no Islam. And some people just walk away because it's too much for them. We have to make it easy for people to try to follow the religion and not sacrifice the deen, but we have to facilitate ease. And not, we can't play down differences of opinion, but we have to be resolute on what we mean by differences of opinion. Is there another question? Final question? No? Okay. Inshallah, we'll break from here. And inshallah, we'll come together next week. And we have the rest of Ayah 197 to work on. Inshallah. Ah, I wanted to mention something very quickly. Um, this term, we've completed, alhamdulillah, most of, we've gone from Surah Al-Fatiha to Ayah 195, and we've completed most of Ayah 196. So we've completed the first term or semester. What we'll need to do is take a two-week break and return for the second semester. And I want to complete the rest of Surah Al-Baqarah. And once we get to Surah Ali Imran, things will start to go much faster. All right? But because we're laying down a lot of information that's uh, legislational and other things, that's why this first semester took so long. So alhamdulillah, I want to say to all of you, um, I appreciate you coming and listening and being patient and taking notes and putting up with, uh, with my accent and all these other things. Uh, there was a long road. Now I want you to take two weeks to reflect over all of what we've done, all the information. And inshallah, two weeks from today, when we return, we have material to go through and then we will obviously, because now we're in the month of Rajab, Sha'ban will not be far away. So my question that I want to ask to you is this. Do you want to, because I think it will be difficult if we continue the tafsir classes in Ramadan, especially because of the timings and people spending time with their families in Salat al tarawih I believe this may be difficult for people. So, should we stop the Friday classes and do something earlier in the day on a lighter topic that doesn't require a lot of note taking and everything because people are fasting, the, the, the blood is not in the brain, it's in the stomach. So we want to know, should we do something in the daytime or maybe on the weekend in the daytime, which gives you then after that a few hours to go home and prepare for Sahur and everything else? Should we do something on the weekend maybe? Yes? How does everyone feel? We'll do something on the weekend, and we will leave Friday calm. We'll leave Friday fallow. We'll leave Friday empty at the end of Sha'ban. So I will give you a week before the end of Sha'ban so you can start preparing for Ramadan because I don't want anyone to suffer during Ramadan and try to concentrate on the speech of Allah as they're listening in the Salah and then have to make notes and other things. It'll be too much for you. So in the last week of Sha'ban, or that final Friday before the final Friday, third Friday of Sha'ban, we will cease from there and have a break. And at the end of Ramadan, at the end of Eid, we will begin again, inshallah. But I will keep you posted with announcements. In fact, if someone can hand out a piece of paper for email addresses, I will keep you posted for what we'll do in Ramadan on the weekend. It will be something light and easy, but something that will encourage you for good, inshallah, and worship. So, I, again, I appreciate you coming for this first term. Inshallah, we have a two-week rest, and we'll start the second term. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will favor us, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Wa shahadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa yatubu ilayk. Innahu ghafoorur rahim. Ya rahmi rahimin. Wa la ilaha illa Allah.